What do you do as an architect in a shrinking city? In a city with a declining population? In a city with a struggling economy? We tend to think of cities in their material sense, as a collection of buildings, streets, sidewalks, homes, and businesses. And as architects, we think it is our right to manipulate that environment through the act of building. But building is an incredibly capital-intensive undertaking. It's an act associated with growth and prosperity. It's an act associated with expansion. And it's through the opportunities afforded to us by expansion that we tend to shape our cities to reflect our contemporary needs and values. But not everywhere is expanding. And not everywhere has the opportunities associated with growth and prosperity. So as young architects, my partner, Tessa Kelly, and I returned to our hometown city of Pittsfield, Massachusetts, because we believed there was work to be done there as architects. Even though it didn't have the context associated with building, it was a post-industrial, shrinking city. And the result of that belief is a project called the Mastheads. The Mastheads are five mobile writing studios that house a writer's residency, scholarship, educational outreach, and programming about literature in place. And the mastheads were designed to celebrate the literary legacy of Pittsfield. Herman Melville, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Catherine Maria Sedgwick, W.E.B. Du Bois, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow were all writing in and around Pittsfield in the 19th century. And what the mastheads do is they take that history and reinvent it, extend it to the present by providing a platform for contemporary authors to come and write about place. And at its core, it is a project about place. It's a project about taking a narrative of Pittsfield and making it belong to the present. This is an image of the center of Pittsfield. And I love this image because the urban fabric tells the history of the city. You have the central square on a north-south, east-west axis, lined by robust civic buildings, but looming in the background is the skeleton of industry. That white building in the background was the GE Polymers Processing and Development Plant. Now, GE was the largest employer in the city through much of the 20th century until it all but left in the 1990s. And to give you a sense of scale in this image, those buildings in the foreground, they're robust. They're 100 feet wide, six stories tall. But over a mile and a half away, that white building is 1,200 feet long. So you can see in this image, when industries leave cities like Pittsfield's, there's a tangible absence of vacancy in the landscape. Over 12,000 jobs were lost during Pittsfield's industrial decline. 20,000 of the city's 60,000 residents left. And so industries like GE and Pittsfield had a gravity not only in the economy, but in people's identity, their sense of self and place. This is an image, a photograph created by Gregory Crutzen of North Street, the main street in Pittsfield. And this image captures the sense of loss that cities like Pittsfield faced. All the traffic lights are yellow. It's a manifestation of that limbo, that sense of uncertainty about the city's identity and future. And so this is the context we return to. There wasn't an economy to reinvent this environment through building, but we wanted to find some way to make this environment belong to the present instead of being just a remnant of the past. So we began to think of the city through a series of different lenses. We thought of the city as a collection of memories, a series of events and happenings. And as every person understands themselves through the lens of their past experiences, we thought if there was some narrative we could take from the city's history and reinvent it or reimagine it, we could change our attitude about the present. So we began to look at salient eras that shaped the city's past. Its agricultural beginnings, its industrial rise. But it's the narrative associated with this image that seemed most poignant to us. This is a view of Mount Greylock and Saddleback Mountain from the south side of Pittsfield. 
and is a view that very closely approximates the view from Herman Melville's study window. And the story goes, when these mountains were covered in snow, they inspired the image of the white whale that populates Moby Dick. Even his neighbor Nathaniel Hawthorne commented on this, saying, there sits Melville in Pittsfield, shaping his gigantic conception of the white whale while staring at those snow-covered mountains. And a few years earlier, Catherine Maria Cedric was laying some of the foundations of our national literature. And down the road, Fanny Kemble and W.B.E. Du Bois wrote. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow penned his most famous poem in Pittsfield, and Thoreau passed through on the way to his train station. So there was a whole network of 19th century authors working in and around Pittsfield. And we saw this narrative as poignant because the words they used still shape our understanding of the city. We still think of Herman Melville's short story, The Piazza, when we look up at the top of Mount Greylock and see the light, and wonder who is looking back down at us. And so that formed the core idea of the mastheads. We wanted to create a small scale of architecture that both celebrated the heritage of writing, this literary legacy, and provided a platform for new creative output in the city. And so thinking as architects, we came up with a form, a monument, a monument being a symbol that connects the past to the present, and a user, a user as a writer, someone that gives us language to understand our contemporary environment. And what we wanted to do was take those two and distribute them throughout the landscape, make mobile monuments, miniature writer studios. By having a mobile monument, we move away from a static conception of history and providing a space for writer in the landscape, they can have their own point of view from which to reflect. And so amazingly, we got a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts to realize this project, to start the residency program and build the studios. So we began designing. We started with the writer, and the goal was to give them an intimate room, a space of their own in the landscape. Eight feet is an economical construction dimension, and 13.6 is the highest height you can transport on a road. And into that room, we needed to create a portal, a threshold, a frame of reference that was their own. Of course, they needed a bench and desk. And the whole apparatus had to be on wheels so it could move throughout the city. And for the exterior, we wanted to evoke that monumental quality. So we made them black and monolithic. Black to confuse the play of light and shadow that typically defines the form of a building and monolithic to move away from elements like window frames and door handles that betray a human scale. And into these monoliths, we engineered a series of operable panels that unfolded so they opened themselves to the landscape when inhabited. And the final form each studio took was inspired by where we found documentation of where those original authors were writing. Herman Melville's study with its pitched roof, an observation tower Thoreau stayed in on the top of Mount Greylock, a piece of attic Hawthorne was obsessed with, the stairwell Longfellow wrote his famous poem about. And so these small pieces of architecture, they're writer studios, they're miniature monoliths, miniature monuments, but they're fragments of historic domestic spaces as well. Here they are, again, confronting that industrial past. Here they are in the landscape outside Herman Melville's estate, abstract forms. And here, when used, you see how they open themselves up here the first season of authors working in them. And if the exteriors of the studios are somewhat severe, the interiors are warm and wooded. I think this picture gives you a sense of how those panels allow a tiny space to unfold to the landscape. And so it was amazing. This first, last summer, we had our first group of residents. And despite their initial uncertainty about the tininess of the studios, some combination of the intimacy and their privileged view on the landscape proved to be very effective. They reported having some of their most productive writing time in months. And because we had this new creative energy through the writers and a real tangible presence in the city through these writing studios, we quickly found partners that wanted to work with us to extend this literary legacy through other mediums. We worked with a local poet, Sarah Trudgeon, who wrote a curriculum of poetry for third graders and brought it to the public schools. Third grade's an important point in a student's education when they're shifting from learning to read to reading to learn. The program is lovingly called Masthead's Fireside after the 19th century fireside poets. 
And we partnered with a local artist who painted the words of the 19th century authors on posters, and we distributed them throughout town town to get a walking tour of language in the city. And we partnered with an English professor, Jeffrey Lawrence, who encouraged us to think of this project in the terms of public humanities, asking how we can take humanities scholarship and make it useful to the present and make it useful to our understanding of our environment. He compiled a reader that contextualized the original work that was written in the 19th century in the scope of the project we were doing, as well as organized a series of lectures to keep the conversation alive in the present. And finally, we partnered with a local newspaper to release a series of folds so everything we were doing could become accessible to all. It documented the lectures, the writing that was being done, the designs of the studios, and anything that was happening about the city during the programming. And so it was amazing to see the support for this program in its first year. Some combination of the historical narrative reimagined and come to life in the present really resonated with people. And for us, the mastheads were an opportunity to respond to this narrative of loss and breathe new life into the city through a small scale of architecture. And I think this image is a testament to that. Still looming in the background, you have the skeleton of industry. But in the foreground, one of our small studios, one of these miniature monuments, pushes into the landscape to provide a new frame of reference for the future. So I'll leave you with one final anecdote about the project. I came and presented this project here to a group of students about a year ago. And the project wasn't complete, but it was well underway. And at the end of my presentation, one student raised their hand and asked, what's your KPI? I'd never heard the letters KPI put together. I didn't know what it meant, so I had to ask, what's a KPI? And the student responded, your key performance indicator. What's your key performance indicator? And of course, I had no answer to that question. I'd never thought of a question like that, so I, I dodged it and, and ended the presentation. But that question really hung with me. And now that this first season has passed, I do feel I have some sort of answer to that question. For me, with the mastheads, the key performance indicator is the performance itself. And I think about performance very broadly as an act with intention. Through the mastheads, we had many residents of the city acting with intention about their urban heritage and an idea about the future. And so going back to the original question of what you can do as an architect in a shrinking city, well, we believe you can strive to shape that environment, be it cultural, historic, or material, by provoking people to perform, if you can provide a platform for people to act with intention about their environment, whether shrinking or expanding, we can make more vibrant cities that belong to the present. Thank you.